In the 80s, when you had your biggest hit, really, Owner of a Lonely Heart, um, probably your biggest hit, or at least yeah, it was. for pe you people know? that, yeah, it was your biggest hit, it right? Was. <laughs> I mean, that was one of the biggest songs. I mean, it's one of the biggest songs ever, but one of the biggest songs of the 80s for sure. Yeah. And it was interesting for me because I grew up, you know, in the 70s. I was in college when that hit. Yeah. And there was, seemed like there was a whole new group of people that experienced Yes for the first time then. Yeah. What was that like as far as the change in sound with the band? You know, 90125 was a... a a miracle in a way for me because I was in the south of France and I'd, I'd let go of Yes because of a, a very bad experience with producers and managers in uh, trying to make an album in Paris that never worked, you know. And it was mm -hmm. outside influences that did that with the band and that's that's part of being in a band. You've got to be careful what outside influences talk about, blah, blah, blah. So I was in South of France writing music about fairies and Marc Chagall, the great Russian artist who I met. And uh, then I went to London and Chris called me up. And I've been listening to the radio, by the way. Uh, there's a gr one of the best radio stations in, in the world. It's called FIP, F-I-P, out of Paris. And they were playing these records from uh, a guy who used to, Malcolm McLaren who was the manager of mm -hmm. um, Sex Pistols, and he did a, an album called Duck Rock with, with Trevor Horn. And Trevor Horn was the bee's knees as a, as a producer at that time. He was having hit records, and uh, he tried to be in Yes for a while, which is really not, not the best gig for him. And uh, he had started working with Trevor Rabin, Trevor uh, Horn, uh, Chris Squire, Alan and, and Tony, they've been calling themselves cinema, and that's when Chris called me and said, uh, do you want to listen to some music? I said, yeah, I'm cool. So we got in his car and listened to these tapes, and they were so amazing, right on that edge where sampling was coming through, and there was something about the songs that really, uh, well, they needed help in some ways, you know, I remember listening to Owner of the Lonely Heart and thinking the chorus is a hit, <laughs> you know, that, but the sounds and, and the, the, the samples, what's the sample? And he said, oh, it's James Brown. Da, 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 da. And I said, it's so Trevor Horn, you know? And um, then I, I, I said, uh, it's missing a few things. And Chris said, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you be interested in singing on the tracks? And I said, well, yeah, I would, because I, I think the production is amazing, to be honest. I think the production is a, a unique energy, and uh, I think that, um, yeah, the, the, the verse of owner needs to be a little bit more spiky at the moment. It's a bit sort of wishy-washy, sort of. That's what I said, anyway. And so he said, well, come on in tomorrow and join the band and we'll call ourselves Yes. And I said, ah, <laughs> that's why, <laughs> yes, because if you join, it'll be Yes, of course it will, you know. So I went in the following day, met Trevor Rabin, and we got on great. Uh, I realized he was a very talented uh, musician, guitar player and everything, songwriter. And... Uh, so we started working on the, the verse from Own of a Lonely Heart. And I, I said right away, it should be da da da, da da da. Because you got da 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 and he, he wrote the second line, and then, you know, we got through the first verse, and Trevor Raven said, you get on with it, because I'm going to have some lunch. And I said, okay, I'll just get on with it. And I just carried on writing the verses, and Tr Trevor Horn helped a couple of times. So it was a very joint experience to, to write the, the verses need to be more, shall we say, interesting, because own of a lonely heart, you know. If you don't take care of yourself, you're going to have a long, lonely heart, you know, sort of thing. Um, so it was a great experience to, to join the band again in, uh, 
in the 90125 time and go on tour, total it, it, spinal tap upside down it was. You know, it was amazing. <laughs> it was. Thank God I saw spinal tap before we started touring. Because <laughs> I, I, would, I, would, I would have been so serious about it. But after that movie, I just said, forget it, you know. I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. This will help me get even more of my dream guests and help continue to grow both channels. Thank you. Did it surprise you that uh, that record was such a massively big record? I just knew the, the owner was a hit. And it's a question then of how they're going to project it. And, you know, we had a couple of guys came along and make a video on top of a skyscraper in London. And we're all dressed up in suits. And then we become eagles or snakes. Or, and it's kind of a fun video. And I thought, well, the new world is MTV. And of course, that, that, was, that, was, that was the 80s, MTV. And, uh, you know, that, that was a great experience, you know, the whole, the touring of the world and everything uh, with that album. And you get treated with, obviously, uh, great respect wherever you go, because you, you're, you're a rock star, <laughs> which is something, something goes over my head, you know, because I was actually on tour of the 90125. I was still working on music uh, and, and discovering new ideas about music that I wanted to create. And so I didn't sort of lock myself into the yes cage, if you like, and, and I'm either yes, I can't go out, I can't, I can't dream anything else, you know. That what I do, I do all the time. I'm always thinking of new ideas and new music. John, when, you're, when you come up with an idea, now, for example, yeah. Do you have a do you have a rig that you use that you uh, or do you use voice memos? Let's say you have a melody idea. What do you do? How do you put it down? How do you keep track of things? You just remember. Yeah, because what I found out was no matter what, that song is not going to go away. When in fact five years later, you're thinking, "Oh, what the hell is that song I keep hearing? Oh, I'll write it. I'll write it. I'll I'll record it." And you know, you come back later with the music that you wrote. I've just finished a piece of music for Christmas that I wrote in uh, 1981. And uh, it's a sim sort of orchestral piece, but I'm putting lyrics to it now, just, just trying it out. Just for a gift for all the fans, put it on, on, you, 